All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for thank you for coming to the July um, Center for Quantum Networks seminar. Um, today, um, I'm excited. We actually have our first external speaker uh, for this series, uh, and they are from industry, which we haven't had yet either. So that's also exciting. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kin Chung Fong. Um, he was born and raised in Hong Kong, and he came to the United States to pursue his PhD under the supervision of Professor Chris Hamill at Ohio State University. Uh, this is where Casey developed his passion for high sensitivity experiments to observe new physical phenomena that cannot be otherwise measured, as we know a lot with uh, quantum. Um, after his postdoc at Caltech, Casey joined BBN Technologies in 2013. Uh, his research now focuses on studying the fundamental physics of strongly interacting, I might say these wrong, uh, Dirac and Weyl fermions in condensed matter systems with their connections to holographic principle and developing the Josephson Junction single photon detector and superconducting qubits for quantum information science, radio astronomy and astronomy and the search of dark matter axions. I'm sure I said at least some of those were drunk. Um, <laughs> so um, we'll let him get started here in a second. Just a couple reminders, please keep your mics muted until the end uh, when you have questions uh, for the Q&A session. If you do have questions as our seminar goes along, please go ahead and just drop those into the chat and we can take a look at those towards the end. Um, and otherwise, I think we are all set to go. So Dr. Fong, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, to invite me to come here to give a talk in the Center of the Quantum Network. Um, I'm uh, Casey Fong, I go by Casey. My first name is Kim Chong. So I'm from Raytheon BBN Technologies. Uh, the location here is it actually is in Boston, um, Cambridge area. So um, it is an R&D company. Uh, we, Originally, the name is a BBN Technologies and then purchased it by Radeon, I think, okay. three years ago. Uh, before, certainly before okay. time joining BBN. So, um, so I think uh, I will try to focus to talk about the quantum research here in the R&D company, just give a different perspective on the quantum researchers. And uh, so I prepare only um, maybe 16 slides, actually less than that. Um, so feel free to um, uh, uh, ask me a question along the way. Um, I hope this will be uh, somewhat useful to you to see the, the research here in company in a little bit different perspective, um, uh, or otherwise that uh, we can end this uh, talk early as well. So uh, it's actually, a, this is a talk that is uh, more challenging to give because um, it's, it's, I try not to talk about technical at all, if ever possible. So just want to show you some of the pictures uh, here in Raytheon BBN Technologies, uh, some equipments and uh, the capability here to do the research. Um, so let me switch to the next slides. All right, uh, so just a little um, advertisement here. Uh, we certainly um, have some open positions uh, together with my collaborators as well uh, in terms of looking for interns, graduate students, postdoc, as well as uh, permanent uh, staff scientists here in BBN. So if you're interested, um, yeah, drop me an email. All right, so um, the outline of the talk. So um, I want to talk about the research outside the academia um, and then the business model in some sense. Um, I try to uh, take the word business model, but it's, it's um, not, nothing about really the, 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 the business as the usual sense. Um, and then, um, of course, uh, this is very important to think about um, money to fund the research, uh, where's the money coming from, uh, how to generate revenues, uh, especially in the company settings. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, uh, I would like to say that um, this is, I'm still learning um, and how to do the research here in companies uh, as well as in academic in some sense. Uh, so uh, I really welcome if you have any comments or questions or something that you would like to discuss, uh, please let me know. Uh, We'll be very happy to uh, uh, discuss uh, all the things together. Now, um, the first thing I want to do here today would be um, just want to kind of uh, breaking the myth of uh, what do, how do we think about the uh, industry research or, or the R&D uh, companies here. 
So um, maybe that is my own misunderstanding when I was a student or postdoc, uh, when I do research in uh, universities, just like any of us. Um, but there's another side of the spectrum that is the industry on the right hand corner here showing uh, maybe uh, someone who is wearing a hard hat, looking more like an engineer making products. Um, so a lot of times we think of these two, uh, two things are very different. Of course they are. Um, for example, in university, we talk about uh, uh, having students and then uh, you know, uh, producing uh, quantum scientists for the future. That is part of the really the mission of the universities uh, and also uh, to produce knowledge as well. But then in the industry, we tend to think more like uh, making a product because that is when we uh, produce a product, we sell the product and then we generate uh, the profits and and then we create revenue in that way. So perhaps uh, uh, more recently, uh, because we are all un still under COVID uh, pandemic situation, um, certainly one of the highlight uh, in the last year is that uh, when I was reading the newspaper, I was told that these uh, coronavirus um, uh, never have any vaccine made before. And uh, certainly the researchers are really spearheaded to um, make it happen. Uh, now many of us are able to uh, have the vaccine. And so uh, the product itself from the research is uh, doing a very important things here that not only generating the revenues, but also trying to uh, change our world uh, for, for better. So uh, there are two sides of, this, of, 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 of the things. One is the industry research, another one is the university. Uh, we tend to think of that as a two, two very different side, but I would like to think uh, a little bit somewhat different. Instead of uh, uh, two things here, more like a binary, I would like to think that this is actually going to be more like a spectrum of things. So in university, yes, we are talking more about uh, focus on the research, um, regardless whether it is immediately useful or not, uh, we don't care as much. Uh, that is the uh, uh, university research, whereas in the uh, company, we, we try to more focus on something that is immediately applicable, or we can make products out of it. So that is two sides of the spectrum, but but just like anything, it is not zero and one. It can be anything in between. Okay. Uh, to me, I think quantum research is kind of uh, more like that. Uh, uh, the long goal, of course, yes, we are trying to make a quantum computer, but uh, uh, in the middle, uh, there's a lot of ground there that we have to cover in order to bring something uh, from the uh, university kind of uh, research all the way to a, a real product. There's a there's a, a big spectrum in between. So as you can see here, um, uh, there's, uh, I just go online and snap some images uh, listing many companies who is trying to uh, engage into the quantum research. There's a long list of them. I'm not going to name, name them all. You will see this picture once again. Uh, these companies are uh, all focused on, uh, if not a lot or majority of it, it will be a big part of it is about the hardware research of the uh, quantum computing. So. Um, in order to make these uh, challenging uh, quantum technologies to happen, of course, the hardware part, uh, we, are, we are still figuring out how to, how to do it in the, on the physical level. So uh, I think a lot of the things that it is kind of trying to bring uh, the uh, forefront kind of a research from the university to, to try to make a product, but that will be a spectrum of it. And uh, as you will see a little bit later, I will give some example of it is that um, in BVN technology, for example, where I'm working, it's actually leaning a little bit towards closer to, to the university. Um, perhaps it is not, uh, this statement is not actually entirely fair at all because um, even within the company, there are people who is uh, doing uh, more closer to a product kind of uh, uh, things rather than uh, towards a uh, more like uh, pure uh, science research. So there's a spectrum of it. I just want to uh, put it up front here um, because uh, for example, um, my uh, day job, you know, um, I, I have to evaluate proposals. I have to uh, try to uh, peer review journal articles. Um, these kind of activities are, uh, is actually, I would say closer to uh, the academic setting. Whereas uh, I help to uh, think about a product uh, write the proposal that is uh, more geared towards uh, how to think about uh, some, some product, perhaps even in Raytheon, that is more closer to the industrial research. So 
uh, there's a big spectrum here that I, I'm, I'm trying to cover and trying to learn how to do it and how to learn, learn to do it uh, good as well. So um, I think that is kind of the things that I want, want to put it up front here, uh, kind of uh, set the background of what I'm going to talk about uh, the quantum research in the R&D, um, especially here in Raytheon BBM technologies. Any questions so far? All right, then uh, we'll move on to the next things uh, about the business model. So I think I mentioned a little bit earlier that um, if we think of it, uh, the university, of course, uh, uh, is producing knowledge um, and, and more young people, uh, the future scientists, uh, whereas in the industry, we try to produce a product. So uh, that is the kind of a business model that generates the revenues and then uh, try to keep the two sides going. Uh, but then uh, just uh, if you, I, I just go into Google and find out, uh, okay, okay, these are kind of a business model. How do you think about uh, these uh, products, then you will think about like how to how to turn the idea into a design concept of a device, for example, let's say you're a qubit, and then you do a prototype, you really make it one working, and then you do more experiments and try to optimize the design until the point that you can launch it into as a real product. Let's say you try to make qubits and start to sell uh, one by one, or in the future, try to sell it like a, a, a 10 qubit at a time uh, in, in on a single chip, why not? Uh, this is a kind of a product coming into a full cycle. So you, you make a product and you generate revenues and then you try to uh, have some more ideas how to make uh, something new and different. And so you keep on moving into this uh, kind of a circle um, to produce um, uh, revenue in that way. Uh, this is how we think about in the industry typically, at least uh, for myself. But there's actually, uh, to me, there's no difference um, or, or little difference uh, compared to uh, university. Uh, with some similarities there. Uh, first of all, uh, in university, uh, we write proposals. Uh, you think about some new ideas, how to do a certain kind of research, what kind of problems that we can solve. And then hopefully uh, some of our proposals are being funded. And then uh, eventually we execute on these projects and we find out, ah, okay, some uh, 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 new thing that we discovered. So that is a publication and use these publications and once again, uh, come back and uh, inspire us uh, uh, to generate uh, new proposals. Uh, in the uh, uh, R&D company research, uh, this is somewhat similar. Uh, so the proposal part could be uh, coming from uh, uh, trying to write a proposal to um, government agencies, for example, got it funded and then eventually turned into a publications. Um, or it can be proposing to the uh, company itself uh, as an internal uh, research and development, uh, and then turn into a uh, funded project, and then once again going into a publication. So uh, that is kind of a, a keep on uh, uh, getting into this circle of uh, producing uh, not only the product but the knowledge um, here that I try to show here. And of course, uh, it is very important to uh, uh, break into this circle to start. Uh, when I joined BBN, uh, one one of the important thing is uh, how to how to how to learn how to break it in. Um, so let me go to the next one. So um, to think about the uh, the, the product um, now, the product in the R and D company can not only be really a, 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 a tangible products that we can we can hand in and sell, but also a knowledge. So the knowledge as a product. So this is uh, somewhat closer to what we think about university. And here showing kind of a little live up here, so showing the interdisciplinary research is uh, very important and, uh, and inspirational to, uh, to, 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 to produce a new knowledge. Um, but then, um, one of the good example could be, let's say, uh, back then we think about uh, nuclear magnetic resonances shown here in the picture uh, that we can see uh, the, the nuclei uh, containing this uh, spin moment that we can actually detect. Uh, and back then we call it uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, the spectrum, the spectroscopy, we can, we can measure that. Uh, that of, of course, originally it comes from uh, pure research uh, back in the days uh, uh, by uh, Block and 
and uh, Purcell that uh, find out how to do this in solid states. And then, um, and then it comes into uh, later on, then the people think about, well, what if we can do these uh, magnetic resonance experiments on a human, for example? Why we, we want to do it, uh, 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 measurement of the uh, magnetic resonance to a human, it is because you can use it as a way to image. That is uh, forming the basis of the MRI imaging. So, of course, MRI today is a product, right? Uh, but then the knowledge is actually coming from the uh, nuclear magnetic resonances. So I want to highlight here is that um, uh, when we say the word interdisciplinary, typically we think about kind of like a, like a uh, university that's different disciplines, and then we uh, try to uh, produce a research, uh, try to uh, generate revenue in that way. But we can also think about as a, as a way to kind of covering the spectrum that horizontally in, in my slides here that uh, between uh, the really the, the pure knowledge in science to purely a product, it will be a long way to go. So from the discovery of the, uh, of the MRI to the time that in the hospital we have an MRI machine, it takes a really long time. And uh, to me, quantum research is kind of like, a, it will be spread like that. And so, uh, so the, 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 the research, if we are able to do it together, uh, university, uh, companies, uh, as well as um, I will talk less about, uh, because I know less about it, is uh, the national lab research, uh, and as well as the government funding. Um, together, I think probably we will be able to accelerate the research a lot faster. Perhaps that would be the kind of the uh, idea of the, uh, to me at least, uh, the uh, center of quantum network as a DRC center that uh, will be able to generate something really good for the quantum technologies. So. That is uh, the little perspective on the interdisciplinary research, uh, how we position uh, the, the company's research uh, with respect to the university research and try to cover different grounds, uh, how, to, how to stretch um, these uh, pure knowledge uh, to the uh, more applicable regime uh, that is closer to the company. So in fact, I think uh, there's a lot of people are doing that already in the, in the quantum world. Um, Highlighted here at the bottom, you saw it already. That is, um, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of things is still kind of remaining at the hardware physical level because it is hard to make a qubit. But then um, when we have it, there's a lot of people spearheaded already and trying to think about uh, how to use it. Of course, that is a very important question. What kind of problem that a quantum computing can solve, right? So um, I, I think those are very uh, important problems uh, to, to think about as we, as we um, move up to the chain here that uh, even up to the places where it turns into a real applications. And ultimately there's some, what we call end users that can really make use of uh, the, the quantum technologies here. So I think the focus has been, uh, you can see uh, if you read um, in online or newspaper, you will see uh, the people talk a lot more about the drug discoveries, uh, finance, cryptography, whatnot, uh, the materials research simulations. But there's another thing that we can uh, let, talk less about is a uh, quantum sensing, for example, uh, how it can be benefit. It might not be having an end users holding a product, but it can be very useful. Uh, I will show you uh, in a minute so some of the things that I try to do. Uh, because as I mentioned, uh, in the company research, we, I have to be really conscious to think about uh, who, who might be the end users. Uh, eventually, the, the, the research, uh, someone has to kind of uh, pay the bill in some sense. So um, I think, let me see, uh, is there any question here? Okay, if not, I will just keep moving. Uh, we may be able to end this talk quickly today. All right, so um, I think certainly one of the important part of the research is uh, to think about how, how to get it funded no matter where you are as a matter of fact. Uh, either you're in company, uh, yes, uh, I, feel, I have to report, make sure that uh, uh, my hours is accounted off. Uh, but if you were in academic, uh, or if you are in academic, then, then you also have to think about uh, how, to, how to get the proposal funded. Uh, so um, to break into this circle is, uh, uh, is important. Uh, in BBN, I think uh, we, it's a lot of, uh, funding is coming from, let's say, DARPA or upper uh, DOD agencies. And the question is, uh, how, how can we uh, convince the, the, 
uh, government agencies that uh, we have the capability to execute this research or why this uh, research idea is important uh, that can justify uh, that kind of um, uh, uh, budget. So this is, uh, to, to break into this circle is not easy, uh, but once you get in here, the publication, uh, for example, or the results can actually help to justify why uh, we are uh, the people should be funded on this project, for example. So, so to, to, to break it in, uh, usually in university, let me show you here. The first point here I try to make is that um, to, to break into this cycle uh, in university, maybe we need the startup money, for example. Uh, you buy the equipment, you hire grad students, uh, you generate results, and then you, um, you, you will be able to uh, uh, get into a topic of research, okay? Uh, in companies, it could be internal R&D. Uh, in the startup company, it can be venture capital. So one way or the other is uh, it has to be uh, uh, funded to kind of a kickstart on of the engines here. So most of the money, of course, uh, then is um, if you if we break it open, uh, I think uh, as far as I understand, both in the university research as well as in company research. I think the labor dollars is usually is the uh, uh, consists of the big proportion of the of the entire budget. Uh, same is true here, but then um, but then there's some some more more constraints in company. For example, uh, especially uh, if you are theory, well then uh, then great. Um, mostly it's on the labor because I think the computer equipment is uh, 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 is easier to to be satisfied, unlike if you do experiments, that is another story because there will be a kind of a, a, a capital cost associated with it. For example, um, in, uh, in, in, in my research, uh, there will be some low temperature physics involved. Uh, if you do not have a fridge, right, uh, then, then there's, uh, there's no experiments can be done. So, so equipment certainly is one very major thing if you are thinking about uh, doing experiments in the company setting. And uh, to justify a, uh, a dilution fridge, for example, uh, to cool the superconducting qubits to uh, 10 mini Kelvin, uh, it, is, uh, it is actually uh, kind of a difficult. Uh, the people immediately ask you would be half a million dollars of a fridge. Uh, how can we make the, make the money back? So, so this is certainly the kind of a question that people will ask and we have to think about how to, how to satisfy that. So there's a uh, money going into the equipment. Material cost, uh, it is there, but a lot of times uh, I think uh, unless it is you, you, uh, people using a liquid helium, I think uh, the materials cost is uh, that consumable part uh, will be the same uh, both in the company as well as in the university. Um, it's kind of a, some part of it is cons kind of a consumable, right? Uh, it is it's used it and then the, that project is gone, then it's gone, it's difficult to recruit uh, the waivers that you have used it already, right? And then uh, the last part of course, uh, there's a clean room uh, fee that, for example, as an experimentalist, I certainly face a lot of challenges here. Uh, the clean room fee uh, uh, can, can be pretty high. Uh, partially, I think um, when, I, when, for example, here in BBN, we try to use the, uh, the university's clean room but then the university clean room basically says that, well, you are a company, you are, must be making products. And they charge us uh, actually a lot more than uh, the, 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 the university cost. But on the other hand, uh, the research, uh, maybe I will show you in a minute, uh, it's actually not up to the product level. We are not try really trying to have Qubit to sell to somebody. Uh, so then the, then the question quickly get into kind of a deadlock uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the small company I put a small here in, in italic because I think um, big company when they, when they try to uh, invest they put a lot of uh, capital investment but a small company a startup company perhaps as well is the problem of that would be that locked it into the situation that there's no really product that to be sold uh, if we ask for the government uh, funding then the, uh, the cost of the clean room fee suddenly it could be uh, at least three times, if not more than in the university. So that, that, is, uh, that is a kind of a strange situation, I have to say, in, in academic. Um, uh, if, uh, if we want to grow a more healthy ecology of 
uh, hybrid research between university, I mean, academic uh, and the industry, then perhaps this is something certainly is something worthwhile to think about um, collectively, to think about how, how we can deal with this, for example, um, because um, uh, we, 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 we got the, the same kind of budget from government funding agency, but then the clean room fee uh, is actually super expensive. Uh, compared to academic. So it is difficult to uh, uh, get some of the budget into the labor cost. Uh, the labor cost here is actually very high as well uh, in, compared to academic. Um, but what you gain here, perhaps I think is to be fair uh, on the defense is that uh, all, all the people in the industry they are more already got their degree and then this uh, can, can, can really uh, uh, get up and going uh, very quickly. Uh, whereas in the university, uh, some students may have still taking courses, whatnot, then uh, and the situation can be uh, varies. But nonetheless, I think in terms of the uh, budget, I think it can be uh, pretty expensive, uh, uh, relatively speaking, uh, compared to the uh, academic. So there's certainly a challenges that uh, I want to put up here. Uh, and uh, in BBN, I think, yeah, it's uh, more like a zero startup effectively. So there's nothing, nothing really uh, happening, uh, except that you just have to go and pound on it, uh, try to get some research done, and then try to feed into this circle, so that we can hopefully it will be a positive feedback. Then uh, life will be a little bit, a little bit easier over time. But otherwise, it, it can actually uh, 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 slow down to the point that it, it cannot get anything done very easily. So that, that is kind of the reality uh, working in the uh, R&D company. And um, yeah, so uh, overall speaking, and I would say basically uh, in the R&D research, especially from a small companies, then the barriers of the entry um, uh, is very high. You have to go for a certain hump. Uh, but of course, if you are getting into some bigger company, I, I was never been there before, but I imagine that as long as uh, your research goal is well aligned to the company, uh, the more like uh, the, 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 the administration, that the objective, then uh, life could be uh, easier as well. So uh, I, think, I think this is, at least this is my perspective on, uh, on especially from where I'm, I, I'm, I'm in, uh, that is the situation. So, question? Okay. If not, then um, let me show you the next thing, um, coming to uh, how to how to break into that circle to uh, generate uh, proposals and uh, fund the proposal, I should say. Uh, one of the way to do it is, of course, uh, is uh, to publish. Um, that is no difference uh, between uh, uh, here an R and D company like BBN uh, compared to academic. Um, so when I joined BBN here uh, uh, almost like eight years ago, um, so the things that I just started was uh, trying to do these um, what we call the uh, electron hydrodynamics. Um, so. So it is actually is a phenomena that the electrons can interact strongly in the materials and have a hydrodynamic behavior. We call it Dirac fluid in graphene. And, um, and that is actually more related to some black hole physics. Uh, so it's kind of funny uh, when, when the administration here asked me, so what is it good for? It's actually uh, not, not easy to answer at that time. Uh, so we find out these uh, hydrodynamic effects in graphene uh, via the breakdown of the Wiedemann Brown's law. That is the law associated to the fact that um, the, the thermal conductance and the uh, uh, and the electrical conductivity is uh, related by this Wiedemann Brown's law, written I think uh, roughly about 150 years ago, almost. But we find out uh, that that can be broken down in uh, in the layer materials graphene. So this is uh, the red dot. Uh, that's the place where I highlighted where the William Wee Brown's law is broken. So uh, the experiment actually was done at PBN, and uh, when we find it out, I was very happy. Um, and then we quickly write it up, and then quickly try to use these to look for new funding. 
but as I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, uh, the, um, the the breaking to this uh, research cycle is uh, is is not easy. Um, so so what we try to do it what at that time was uh, try to perform the experiments in in a fridge. So uh, at that time I don't have a dilution fridge accessible to me. So I just you know put it up uh, and pick a project that can be done uh, without a dilution fridge. So, so you can see this is the, the setup. Uh, and then uh, I don't have uh, the, the people to help me out to do the uh, superconducting mat matching network. So I have to do a normal coil and try to test it out, make sure that it works and then, uh, and then perform this experiment. So this is kind of the things that uh, try to, uh, uh, in, in our and company, we have to uh, work with uh, some constraint. So just try to do whatever we can. And then uh, once we break it in, then uh, we can we can we can get some proposal uh, and get it funded and continue. Now, of course, uh, um, now uh, we have a few dilution bridges here in DBN technologies. Uh, in the picture here on the left hand side is one of them. Uh, when we have the equipment, then of course uh, we have to address to the problem. Uh, the problem. Uh, not only is about the uh, pure scientific interest, but it also associated to uh, some practical problem that the people have been thinking or about to think about it. Uh, so the, the pure research one is uh, the one that I showed you a little bit earlier. We, we think about uh, electron hydrodynamics. Um, but then uh, the problem that the people may think about is uh, how to make a qubit lifetime longer. For example, shown here, the superconducting qubit lifetime, we try to make it longer. Uh, as well as uh, the size of a qubit is actually pretty big because of these uh, meander line resonators, these are superconducting uh, microwave resonators, resonators that we have. On a footprint here, maybe on the order of uh, one centimeters, you can fit a finite amount of a qubit, superconducting qubit. Uh, so if you want to make a million qubit, uh, and if your, your footprint, uh, so this is roughly about one centimeters uh, in dimension, if you want to fit a lot of qubit inside, on a chip, then uh, that is not possible in a small chip. And you have to make a dilution fridge that is very big. So it is so big that I think this is a picture from IBM, for example, that their dilution fridge is going to be so big that a person can walk in. So it is, it is, it is big. So the question then, of course, uh, how can we shrink the size of the qubit, make it with a longer a qubit lifetime, uh, and also think about some uh, something that we have not not many people think about it yet. Uh, so here showing uh, one of the results from Yale group on the superconducting uh, single photon detector. How, how can it be used if we have, when we have one that's operating reliably, can be used to uh, herald the uh, quantum entanglement between two qubits uh, under the DLCC scheme, for example. And if that works, then we can think about a quantum network, okay? so. So, so here showing three things, uh, addressing to the problem is uh, the lifetime could be a problem, the qubit lifetime, the realization time. The size of a qubit can be a problem. Uh, some new functionality, such as detecting the photons can be a problem. So how can we address these problems uh, to, to generate enough values to, to, to get the research funded in DBN? So one of the things that I did is, of course, I am coming from the background when I was a, a postdoc. Uh, my, I come from the background of uh, doing layer materials and showing here, uh, it can be many different kinds of layer materials. They can be very clean, can be used for uh, making qubits for a longer lifetime. So uh, showing you on the right-hand side here is one of the funded projects that we have uh, together with uh, Columbia University, Jim Hans group. Uh, so together we sent out a proposal to uh, LPS to make a qubit. Uh, so highlighting here is that uh, uh, the laser pointer, if you follow the red dotted line here, is uh, I'm, I'm trying to point to a, a conventional qubit. So this is a conventional qubit size with a capacitance wings. So it is actually on the order of a millimeters here. Okay, this is a conventional qubit. And the qubit that we made out of layer materials it actually is smaller than the dot, the laser pointer that I have here on the screen. So this is actually located at the place where I point to. So we, 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 should, we are able to 
make it a lot smaller right now, uh, rough, by roughly about uh, uh, 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than the co conventional qubit, uh, transform qubit. So we are about to uh, writing it up to publish this result. And, but it shows some of the example here that uh, we are trying to uh, really target some, some, some problems that I think uh, uh, people are concerning and, and try to do some very targeted research. So this is one of a favor that um, uh, uh, the, of the research that I have here in uh, 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 R and D company is uh, trying to think about how, how we can how we can make uh, such a small qubit to happen. So uh, basically, leveraging on some of the things that that we can do. Yeah. So just uh, to bring the message to the point, this is the capacitance that we make in this uh, program we call a super van. Uh, compared to some of the capacity that, that was made before. Uh, in terms of the cleanliness level, yeah, we are, we are still uh, on par with some of the uh, qubit that is being made before. But in terms of the area, we shrink it by roughly about a thousand times here, only on the capacitor alone. So uh, that is quite some improvement there. Um, so kind of a teaser that, uh, the, so, uh, Keep on that, and now on the archive, we will publish this uh, pretty soon in the coming few months. Now, and then um, we also have to think about um, how to generate revenues in, in different ways. Um, if you think about the, uh, the spectrum of the research, from the pure research to making something that is more applicable, uh, then, um, then it will get into the, ten the, 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 the technology uh, spectrum. Uh, showing here on the left is some of the things that we do uh, here in BBN that uh, we think about the graphene, uh, which has a very giant thermal response to the uh, to the microwave because of the photon heating. Uh, we can think of it as a very good uh, microwave barometer. That is by measuring the temperature rise in the graphene, we can we, we will be able to make a very high sensitivity detector. So showing here is the uh, uh, SEM images of um, of the device itself. So it's published, published the last year uh, in, in Nature. And uh, the project actually is kind of fun. Um, so we have to first understand and measure you know, the electron phonon couple. And this is a really pure science. Uh, uh, think about the heat capacity of the Dirac fluid or the electron gas of the, or in, in, in graphene. And then think about how to make, make, it, uh, make, it, make a measurement out of it, predict how it should behave. Is it a worthwhile thing to do uh, as a goal? And how, what's, what kind of performance we should expect? Um, so, so this is really a, a really a stretch between uh, a thorough understanding on how the electrons or so the mass that's Dirac fermions in graphene, uh, how should they behave thermally, and then take it all the way to make a barometer. So the barometer that we made here um, uh, is uh, actually is a capacitive couple with an antenna design here. Is a half wave resonators and the graphene actually sitting right in the middle to absorb the heat. So this is a, a, a kind of a through and through uh, taking this uh, graphene, making it all the way with a chosen 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 junction here to to make it happen. So the device is looking like this. Uh, you can see there's a there's a top range here, SME connect, uh, connectors, and then uh, there's a device here. Okay, so. Uh, and then uh, since we're talking about science technology, uh, once we have some of the really advanced technology, we can go back and think about fundamental science. And the fundamental science on this particular part is that uh, it turns out this detector as we made it, um, the sensitivity is so high, it is up to a level that is limited fundamentally by the thermal fluctuation of the device itself. So because the device is small enough now, that uh, it, it actually at low enough temperature, it will have this uh, temperature fluctuation. And you can think of it as more like a Johnson noise uh, in the electrical circuit. But there is a thermal noise that is kind of uh, 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 in the analogy to the, to, the, to the Johnson noise in the electrical. And so it is this uh, thermal fluctuation that is limiting the, the, the detector sensitivity. So that is the fundamental limit that it cannot be surpassed it, as long as we uh, use the concept of a microwave barometer to detect the microwave. Uh, so there's a bound, and we show that our detector can reach this uh, 
particular bound uh, fundamentally uh, limited by uh, some statistical mechanics that we learn in in, uh, in 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 the classroom. So so that is the kind of things that we we try to do is uh, we try to uh, take take the most fundamental science and try to make the best technology and we come back and try to test out some of the really basic ideas. Try to make another example here uh, is the uh, the latest uh, single photon detector that we I able to make uh, in the near infrared uh, that is um, communication grade laser kind of uh, a range. Uh, of course, the photon energy is uh, very high there, and therefore it is somewhat easier to uh, make a detection. And when we sprinkle the light, the photon from a laser source, uh, it can actually we can actually see this junction start to switches. Uh, it's a, a current bias the junction. So the requirement there is uh, we have to have a thorough understanding on uh, how the Johnson junction uh, behave as a phase particle. And in some sense, uh, that is uh, how the qubit works as well, right? Uh, because um, the, the phase particle actually have these uh, uh, quantized energy levels in a current bias the Johnson junction. And and under this uh, understanding, uh, the phase particle of the Johnson junction itself uh, is actually is a quantum particle. So a lot of these um, uh, current understanding of the superconducting qubit is based on that. And we use it to try to see if we are able to understand, uh, for example, uh, the, how this uh, phase particle behave, the probability how it switch or not to switch, and we can fit it to some lines that is, you know, based on the uh, what we call quantum uh, microscopic quantum tunneling um, mechanism. When there's low light, and then when there's light turning on, we have to also study it so that we understand how the junction behave. And eventually, we use that to look into the photon itself. And when the photon comes in, as we dial it up, the number of the counts that we have of the photon become higher and higher. And so this graph is actually showing we are able to see the single photon itself as well as the short to short noise uh, uh, from a laser source. So that is a, another example that we will try to do both in terms of the uh, fundamental science as well as the detectors. And of course, this detector can be uh, extremely useful uh, for uh, not only uh, for, the, for the quantum computer itself, but also can be useful for um, some uh, radio astronomy mission that uh, to try to measure the spectroscopy of the infrared sources uh, in the in the in the in the universe, or uh, we want to also do the dark matter research. Uh, so to look for the dark matter, we need a very good sensitivity detector. And so uh, so I'm, I'm I'm lucky that uh, to have the collaborators uh, uh, working together to to try to use this kind of a detector, the graphene detector, to to look for dark matter right now. So these are the kind of a favor that uh, we have in the R&D company uh, to try to uh, explore uh, every territories that we, we, we can apply uh, our knowledge. And of course, uh, this is uh, something I think I mentioned it already that is uh, very important to have um, uh, to, to kind of um, uh, uh, solve the problem uh, Doing research is hard. Um, it's hard in different, in many different ways. Uh, but, but I think it's actually true. Uh, uh, doing uh, doing research in different places must have their own challenges. So um, so one of the things that I think I'm lucky is uh, to have uh, many collaborators um, trying to work together. Uh, I think the importance uh, of that is is um, not only that they provide a lot of uh, help. Um, that is something tangible. For example, uh, uh, I, I need to make a, 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 a Joseph Junction, for example. Uh, I need some help, right? Uh, I ask collaborators to help out on some of the fabrication uh, 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 parts. But also, I think uh, more importantly, they provide a lot of uh, intellectual uh, uh, inspiration as well as uh, uh, learning on, uh, on different topics to cover a big ground. Um, uh, so, so highlighted, for example, here, uh, some of the detectors that I mentioned to you, uh, the Zosun Junction Physics, um, I, I learned a big part of it from, uh, from my colleague, Tom Oki, as well as uh, Gil Ho Lee. 
and uh, some of a uh, lot of our detectors uh, understanding is uh, from uh, uh, from Dirk, uh, my collaborators, uh, working together with uh, Dima. We we know a lot more about uh, how to use the twisted bilayer graphene, all right, um, and the simulations. Um, uh, Yi Bing Wu, who is uh, in Air Force, help help us to understand the uh, the plasmodic mole coupling to the to the detector. And then uh, more recently, uh, uh, when you see the superconducting qubits uh, that we made out of the layer materials, we can make it become very small. Uh, it's a collaboration with uh, uh, Jim Hong from Columbia University that uh, find out uh, many different ways. Uh, traditionally, layer materials is not being used in the, in the, in the high frequency microwave world. But then uh, we actually solve a lot of problems uh, to, to, to get it done. And then uh, certainly I, I'm I'm no I'm, I'm not a high energy physicist, but uh, uh, Dodi Marsh, David Marsh, uh, who is now in King's College of London, uh, he has been uh, teaching me a lot about the dark matter um, and how to understand it. And now we try to uh, move forward to really make some uh, antenna design to cover a uh, big spectrum on the uh, dark matter search right now. So that's uh, kind of uh, highlighting uh, some of my collaborators here that uh, uh, working on different parts um, to contribute on uh, different parts that we might be able to uh, generate uh, interesting results in the quantum research. So um, let me see. Right. OK, so that is basically the end of my talk here. Um, basically, I mentioned about a few things uh, about the, the academic research and the industry research. Have, at least how I think about that uh, as a as a big spectrum, not zero and one, but anything in between. And then uh, the business model: how to how to create some uh, research, get it done, get it funded, and how to uh, a little bit per personal experiences on how to overcome some of difficulties uh, that may happen uh, not only in R and D company but also in uh, academic in general. Uh, and um, and. And perhaps uh, I want to, as a summary, summary, I want to think more like a, a different places. It's more like a, a having a different vehicles to carry our research. Uh, of course, uh, different vehicles as a, a maybe good at a different terrain. And uh, but by doing the collaboration, we are able to cover a bigger ground uh, in a more efficient manner, as well as uh, can we can accelerate the process of the quantum research. Um, so I think uh, here I think want to emphasize that as a since I'm talking in a, in a ERC centers I think it's, it would be great to build a more healthy you know uh, ecological system for the quantum research. Uh, so uh, if we are able to do that, then certainly it will be great for for the for the quantum uh, science and technology. So. Um, lastly, I would like to uh, thank um, my sponsors. Uh, uh, sponsoring some of some of my research as well as uh, the support that I received from different places, uh, including uh, NSF. Uh, it does not really directly fund my research, but uh, it actually funded uh, many of the uh, my collaborators, the students or my collaborators, collaborators themselves. And so, actually, I'm kind of indirectly benefit from it as well. Uh, and as well as uh, since I'm a, I'm a research associate at Harvard now, uh, actually. Uh, I really value that uh, positions because I will be able to uh, connect it to the academic research in a more efficient manner. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, the place BBN Technologies uh, that I think uh, is kind of a unique place where um, uh, I, I will be able to conduct some of the research that I'm doing. Uh, for example, I come and give a talk. I don't need to really uh, uh, worry about um, uh, too much about uh, uh, my other things uh, because I really have the kind of freedom that the company allowed me to do it. Um, when I have to go to conference, uh, they actually encourage me to do, uh, as well as uh, doing patent, for example. I think those, those are obvious ones. Uh, doing patents, I think company, of course, they're, they're happy about it. But they're also happy when I go to conferences, as well as uh, writing a paper up. Uh, there's no complaint there. So I think I should be grateful for that as well. And uh, being in company, I think, uh, um, uh, also have the benefit of um, seeing some of the more uh, applicable kind of a research uh, that I may not immediately get involved, but nonetheless, uh, I can, since I'm, I'm, I'm 
in the environment where I can see, and therefore I'm more kind of um, uh, able to uh, uh, look at all the actions uh, from my colleagues. And that I think is uh, actually also benefit my research in a, in, a, in a indirect manner. So with that note, I think I would like to thank you for all of your attention. Great, that, that was, thank you, that was great. Um, I think that was a very nice kind of overview of industry and how it relates to quantum. Um, do we have any questions? Looks like we've got one in the chat. Benjamin, did you want to unmute yourself and ask, or I can ask for you if you'd like? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I, I was wondering if you could describe a little bit how your daily activities differ from that of a PI, because we see you at the end of the uh, list of authors, so it looks very similar to a PI in, in academia. Great. Right. Uh, thank you for the question, actually. Yeah, it's interesting. So. Um, uh, a big part of it, it might not be that much difference. Uh, one important thing is, uh, of course, we don't need to teach, right? So that, that makes a huge difference. Um, uh, I think also um, in the academic, I suppose there's uh, some more duties um, in the faculty, for example, right? Uh, now, of course, uh, then that will translate into some other duties that um, the faculty members uh, do not have, whereas we do. Uh, for example, sometimes uh, the people will come and email me and ask me some technical questions uh, from different parts of the company. So one of the interesting questions um, uh, recently I, I had was, uh, uh, can I have a, a thermoelectric powered uh, underwater vehicles, vessels? So, so, so actually that project is, uh, actually you can, you can search online in Wikipedia, it's called Poseidon. Basically, what it, what, what it is, is that there's a lot of vehicles that uh, is uh, 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 used as buoyancies. It will dive into the, to deep into the ocean. And then as it floats, it will try to measure the temperature and the, uh, yeah, the, mostly about the temp temperature as, as it floats up. And every time when it comes up, it will try to use a GPS system to connect it to the, to the, to the outside world and report what is the values and the location of the vehicles. And the Poseidon project basically is a, is a research project trying to understand our ocean. But then they, these vehicles, they have to charge it up uh, once every three months. So then the people come and ask me, oh, is there any way that they can be self-powered in some sense? So with a, with a thermal electric event, because the temperature gradient is so high uh, between the, the surface of the water to the bottom of the ocean. So then I have to, you know, get into uh, some calculations as a, as a physicist, then you have to think about uh, 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 how, how much power that you need, uh, how much uh, uh, power that we can generate. And then suddenly it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very open uh, question, right? Whether it can or cannot. Then uh, I suddenly will walk into uh, like, like a half a day suddenly, just to basically go and answer that question. So that certainly is uh, somewhat interesting to me. Um, but uh, that, that is something that I, I may, maybe in the university have, have the same kind of things as well. I don't know, but uh, certainly it's uh, uh, something uh, uh, interesting. And then, and then the person came and tell me and how to understand uh, uh, the, the ocean at, a, at a, there's a sound, sound wave mode that the whales can you know, talk to each other because there's a wave guy under, under, underneath the ocean. So that is something that is uh, interesting for me to learn at the same time. So, uh, yeah, I think I think that is, uh, and then I, I have to go back to the lab, for example, after this talk, and I have to go get back and work with the, uh, the, the, the researchers. Some of them are in the universities, some of them are my colleagues, uh, back into the lab and try to, you know, uh, get some problems solved. So we, we are a little bit, you know, uh, have to be, a little bit more cautious about the, the time, uh, how fast we can do things. I think that might be the, the major difference. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I hope so, I answered so, Yeah, it's a good question. So, so you get to spend quite a lot of time in the lab, unlike PIs in general. Uh, in some sense, we have to, because that is the hours they pay for, right? 
yeah, that's that, that's the reason. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I like it in that way too. In, in some sense, maybe maybe in national labs, uh, a part of it is uh, the, is the same. I don't know. So that is certainly something that I would love to explore in the future. Any other questions? Probably have time for a couple more. Um, I have a question. So hello, Kisi, and it was a great talk. And I have a question about your research on um, um, graphene. So I guess it is more like condensed matter physics research and by its nature, it's more like more fundamental physics. So was this research funded by uh, BBN company, or was it funded by more academia? Because as I said, it's more like fundamental research. So I was wondering whether BBN company like is interested in like condensed matter. Right. Um, it's mostly funded by the government at this point. Um, so at a very early on, um, I think I, I would say uh, in the company, if they don't stop you from doing that, to me, it's kind of funded already. So they may as well come in, come into my lab and say, "Hey, you know what? Stop this, right?" So uh, to me, if, if they don't stop me, then that means oh, good to go. Uh, but the question, I flip it around, would be: um, if they don't stop you, would you have enough resources to get the things done? That is a question that, and as, as you you know, uh, uh, as a PI, you have to you have to you have to answer that question. Or when that problem is solved, would it be impactful enough, right? Or it, it can be two different levels. One is, of course, uh, I since I, I thought I'm I'm doing the uh, R and D in company since I give a talk about it. I, I try to kind of a little bit focus on the money side because this is more tangible. You can calculate, in fact. Um, but there's another part that is more intellectually satisfying. That also has a value, but that value is, uh, you know, is, is less of an assignment of a real number, but it's more to yourself. Or maybe some of the people that you know, also in this community, also think that problem is very important. For example, hydrodynamics. So uh, in, in that regard, then, um, then, uh, then, then, then we have to think about uh, how, how much of the time and how much of the resources we can devote it into that particular topic. So um, I still remember uh, one of the things that more like a like an enlightening moment for me when I was a when I was a postdoc is find out that how much I would have cost to my to to do, to my to my boss then right I I, I was a postdoc and I have a you know, faculty member who is funding me and then when I know that how much uh, actually some of the cost is actually going into the overhead for example. Then I started to realize that, oh my God, um, in order to fund my research from me doing this particular research in full time, how much would it cost? Okay, then uh, in the university, there's a values. Then you come and think about, well, how much, how many proposals do I have to write in order to support this? Okay, now the difference is that in the, in the R&D company, the dollar amount is different. The constraint is different. The resources that is available are different. Okay, now you factor in everything together. Would you would you like to how how many winning proposal that we can write and how many good project that we can produce? Everything factor in, then we have to make a decision how to how to conduct our research in a, in a in a team in a group or uh, for yourself. So that is the kind of the things that I think um, uh, that kind of need to be done and think about. And I would say one thing, since we are talking about a quantum research here, is that the quantum research actually provide a very interesting uh, um, ground that connect the fundamental research to the uh, more applicable research. For example, I, I would have not known, I, I would never have known that uh, the, the, my, my research can be connected to that metaphysics at all, right? So, so once I find out that, okay, I can generate values to those people, I immediately I feel that, okay, this is, this is great. You know, I would rather like to put a little bit more time to mix some 
very reasonable uh, projection and plan and how to make it happen. So, so that is certainly something, uh, at least to me, this is super interesting. And, uh, and it is certainly, it's a great opportunities. If we are able to do a very in, interdisciplinary research in, in a hybrid environment, uh, covering uh, a bigger ground, I think it will generate a lot of uh, interesting science in, as we move along. Thank you. All right, um, just real quick, I did drop uh, the link to the survey that we do for each of our seminars in the chat. So if you can just take a few minutes to complete that um, once we're off here, I'll also send out an email with that same link for those people that have hopped off or maybe don't get a chance to click on it before uh, we end things. Uh, but I think for the sake of time, um, I think we should all thank uh, Dr. Fong for giving such a wonderful talk today. Um, and we will see everybody hopefully next month for our next seminar. And I will get details about that out soon. So thank you again, Dr. Fong. That was wonderful. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thank you.